Hi, Daniel. Hi, Mark. Thank you for joining me today and sharing your insights. Now, to give listeners a bit of background, I'd love to get to know your journeys as well. Uh, both of you have had such varied careers spanning many, many years now, um, up to, I guess, the current moment where you're running what you would say would be Australia's largest accounting firm brokerages. So, Daniel, why don't we start off with you? Tell us about your journey up to the, today's date. Yeah, it's been interesting. So, started off as a corporate accountant, cutting my teeth in large corporations like Mobile Oil and Just Jeans. Loved accounting and then started to realize that my passion was in accounting, but not doing accounting. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, Very common. <laughs> yeah. Moved out of that arena into um, software and started off with Thomson Reuters, where learned about accounting software and accounting information and how to approach that type of um, dynamic with accounting, accounting firms. And then from there, found myself working for large software vendors like MYB, Zero, and Intuit. Um, so that was an interesting journey. Um, got to the point though where knowledge was built up and I really wanted to do something on my own and be my own boss. So I came up with the concept of DMY and originally DMY was centered around being a consulting firm to help accounting firms in succession phase or growth phase. And um, the long story short that the the, the plan pivoted um, probably 12 months into me starting the business um, with an M&A opportunity. And um, fast forward to where we are today and we're now just an M&A firm. So yeah, the knowledge built up over the last, coming up to 20 years in the accounting industry has certainly been useful. Um, we relate to the accountants in public practice. Um, but um, yeah, it's it's one of those things that has transpired over the years. How are you enjoying M and A part of it versus the consulting aspect? Oh, look, I, personally, I feel a lot more comfortable in that M and A delivers an end result, a service that delivers a business being sold to a buyer who mm -hmm. purchased it. Consulting, I found y you could obviously work with people to get outcomes, but it was always them doing it. So, you know, I always had it in my head. Yeah, you had to support them doing it, but they effectively had to do it. So I didn't want to be a preacher standing up on stage, right? So, you know, my preference is to be where I am now because I love the diversity and being dynamic in the M&A space, right? Because there's no single straight line path to success. It's involving humans and there's different deal constructs that we see nearly every day. So it's quite enjoyable. Fantastic. And it's doing what you've been doing for many years, which is working at the forefront with accountants, implementing, um, you know, helpful technology services delivery. But now I guess you take, you're going in the back end of that and ensuring that accountants have done a good job and managing, helping some to grow and helping some to get out. Um, so yeah, I can see how you previous experience would help you a lot in the current space. Yeah, that's right. Um, and Mark, your turn. You've had a very interesting journey since, I believe, being a partner at PwC in the 90s to joining Daniel in the in this successful business um, earlier this year. Tell yeah, that's yeah, that's correct, Michael. So, so look, I, I'm, I'm originally from the UK. I've been in Australia of oh, about uh, 20, 23 years now. Um, long, long enough. Yes, lo yeah, lo lo long enough. To be a local, yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's right. Apart from when we're playing cricket. Um, <laughs> but uh, we well, let's uh, move quickly on from that. So look, as you said, I, I spent the first part of my career, uh, a dozen or so years um, with PwC uh, between London, uh, Sydney and Melbourne. I was, a, as you say, was a partner in the, the firm's um, consulting practice. Um, I, I had a fantastic time there. It gave me a, a wonderful grounding in terms of uh, the rest of my career. But I'd also was at a point where I was sort of thinking, you know, whilst I've had a fantastic learning experience, I didn't want to spend all my career in one organization. So mm -hmm. um, the early 2000s, I, I felt was the right time. It, it was the right time for me to leave at the time. And I actually took a year off and spent a year traveling around the world um, with my, at the time, girlfriend and now uh, wife and uh, mother of my two children. So uh, <laughs> uh, we, always, we always sort of joke about that was uh, the best career move we both ever made, actually packing our job <laughs> and, uh, go, going off traveling for a year. Um, I love that story. And it seems like you joined a travel company straight after that. Well, it's funny because people say, oh, you spent a year traveling, so you joined, joined the travel industry. And uh, <laughs> it, it was a bit more of a coincidence. It was, uh, but the, 
the thing that appealed to me then and which I sort of carried through my career um, was the travel industry at the time was uh, undergoing quite a, a period of disruption. So the, this was around 2004 when a lot of the online players were starting to come into the market and people were saying, mm -hmm. you know, this could be the death of, uh, death of travel agents and they need to reinvent themselves, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I got involved running what at the time was uh, 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 um, a group of travel, uh, travel agency uh, group called uh, Harvey World Travel. Uh, which is now part yep. of the morphed into the Hello World group, um, but it was interesting, and it's probably there's probably a parallel there um, with accountants sort of facing significant change as well. That the you know the good uh, the industry didn't disappear at all. The good ones um, changed and adapted and continued to thrive, and and the ones that were probably a bit more change resistant and head in the sand um, did suddenly find with a whole bunch of uh, online competition they became less relevant to their customers. So. Um, yeah, that was an interesting period in the travel industry, and I, I then spent um, probably the you know the last ten or twelve years. Um, I, I had time in the uh, business banking industry, um, did a bunch of work at Bank West shortly after um, that had been acquired by CBA. So that was quite an interesting uh, leadership transformation role. Uh, in the business bank, um, trying to help turn that business around, and then spent about six or seven years at West Farmers. I was the uh, chief operating officer uh, for OEMPS, which at the time was about the third or fourth largest insurance broker mm -hmm. in Australia. And then um, West Farmers sold that business, and then I moved across and ran um, Coles Insurance for Coles um, for three years. Um, but uh, probably similar to the time when I decided to. Uh, um, have a break from my career and go off training for a year. I, I'd got to quite a pivotal, pivotal point about three years ago. Um, my wife and I had set up a uh, startup business in the food sector, actually, um, about a year prior to that, which is which is my wife's sort of main baby, and I just provide some sort of commercial and strategy support on the side. But uh, I guess working more in that sort of smaller entrepreneurial space, I was finding, you know, after 20, 25 years, um, you know, running large businesses for other people, I was getting more enjoyment actually working in a small, smaller, more entrepreneurial business uh, as the business owner. So I, I decided to step out of sort of big corporate life and actually uh, go and find a, a business opportunity for myself. And um, I wasn't, didn't specifically go at the time, right? Um, you know, a specialized brokerage firm working in the accounting sector is what I want to do. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, you said Daniel I, to the guy I wanted to work with. Uh, yeah, no. That, exactly, I was going to say. Yeah, until you right. met Daniel. Yeah, that's right. Daniel and I didn't know each other at all, but uh, I, 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 I was looking at a whole bunch of things, actually. Um, and through the course of that, someone I know was actually looking to purchase an accounting firm. And he said, look, can you come give me a hand, um, you know, exploring some opportunities and doing some DD on some businesses and stuff for me. And through the course of that, I actually came across DMY, um, and having spent a little bit of time kind of reflecting on that industry and where it was at, it felt like a, a really interesting business in a really interesting industry at a really interesting time. So I, mm. I literally cold emailed Daniel and said, you know, here's where I'm at. Here's what I'm looking to do. Here's the kind of experience I've got. Why don't we uh, have a cup of coffee? And um, we sort of uh, spent six months getting to know each other. Um, I started... Uh, becoming a, a doing some consulting to the business so you know it was almost a bit you know daniel could get to know me i could get to know daniel in the business and then yeah. um yeah then we joined forces um at the start of this year and, and formally went into business together but uh you know we've really been working together probably just over a year now so uh, it, it's been fantastic it's fantastic it's a great Michael story marks the brains of the business that's for sure <laughs> well, I love this. Well, my, well, my better half speech. Yes. Well, and the beauty, apparently. So I'm not. I'm not sure what Daniel's doing, really. Uh, yeah, that's right. Brains and face. Yeah. I'll be happy. Yeah. I'm more than happy for Mark. You are that. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. No, it's it, it's interesting, actually. I mean, we've got because uh, you know when you look to go into business with someone as a, a, a as a quick tangent, I think we've got a really you know we've got a really good alignment around values, which is kind of fundamental to any. Um, you know, sort of business co-owner relationship, and but we've got sufficient um, differences in skills and experience that we actually work really well together. You know, if we if yeah. we both come, and that's important. Yeah, like we've got relevant backgrounds and relevant experience, but you know, if mm. we're a mirror images of each other, you know, you it, it wouldn't work as well. So um, yeah, no, it's been uh, it's been great so far. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Mark. Um, and uh, look, it's an interesting point that you bring up about sort of your experience in travel and how you can see the accounting industry going through that as well, um, where, you know, there's, the, there's probably three major pillars for disruption. And that's one is probably the tech with, you know, zero and everything going online. Um, people saying, well, you know, do we really need accountants when zero could pretty much do everything for me, do a BAS, can do all the reconciliation, et cetera. Um, the ATO is probably another with constant changes and trying to go the way that New Zealand did. Um, and then I would imagine outsourcing would be another big thing that keeps people awake or at least preoccupied in terms of how that will impact um, the industry as well. So, but more importantly, uh, I like a point you brought up about your partnership with Daniel. And I think it's super relevant to our listeners where, you know, A, there's a succession planning issue for a lot of people going into retirement, but then there's also young people, you know, chopping and changing firms, looking for the right firm to partner up with or going to partnership with. Um, what would you suggest, like having gone through it yourself and having worked with so many accounting firms, what is the optimal way to to strike up a partnership to ensure you're entering the right partnership in terms of either the, the process or um, how long it should take, you know, to ensure that you don't end up in a partnership that you don't want to be in. Well, what sort of comments would you guys have to make about yeah, it? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I mean, it's not, it's not too dissimilar to the, the sort of M&A process itself. I mean, the first, the first thing I'd say is, you know, ultimately it comes down to cultural fit an alignment of values that you know that, mm -hmm. that piece to me has to be the kind of bedrock of any relationship you know if you're looking to go into business with someone you haven't you, you haven't necessarily you don't need to be best mates but you've got to be aligned in your values and you've got to have respect for each other now you yep. can now once you've got those that doesn't then automatically mean right this is the right person to go in a partnership with you know, you've got to think, you know, for me, you've got to think strategically around what, you know, what do you want to achieve personally? What is it you want to achieve from a business perspective? And does this person, you know, you're looking to go into partnership with or, or multiple people, you know, is that the right individual or group of people that can help you get there? And does, does you know, strategically, does it make sense for you? Uh, and then, you, you know, do the economics of the deal work? You know, am I mm. going to get a reasonable percentage, you know, in a reasonable return based on, you know, what I've got to put into the thing? But that's, that, that's, that's for me the order I would consider those things because... It, so what, what, would you, yeah. what would you advise? So specifically, say, say I was a 30-something-year-old senior manager, associate director in a firm, look, you know, I've got someone that tapped me on the shoulder, said, look, there'll be an equity opportunity um, with her firm, we're growing fast, I'm retiring, or... And one of the partners that's retiring, there's three others. Um, what would you advise that individual to? How they, how should they go about the process to ensure it's the right decision, the right fit? Because the cultural fit and alignment of values are 100% important. But when, how long does it take to, you know, to figure out whether that is the right, um, the right fit? And also, what should you be looking at? Well, mm. to also, I think the first thing, and it's typically something I constantly see in the market, and that is in these examples. Do both because in that situation, the same Michael, the there's an employee working in the business that's being asked to step up, and so often we hear from partners of accounting firms then coming to us saying we've tried that and it didn't happen, um, and mainly because I think personally there has to be an element of trust um, because you constantly hear things around oh you know the manager doesn't want to take on more debt they've got already an extraordinary amount of debt and kids in private school and expensive cars and wanting a holiday so they don't want to take on that risk but realistically i think they would take on that risk if they felt that there was a, as mark said a, a cultural alignment values commercially a deal to be struck for them to reap the reward but if all that's failing there's got to be a missing element and that's got to be trust i mean you know if they don't if that person doesn't trust the other person and can't trust the other person nothing's going to work so a lot of that stems around it. But in terms of process, um, I would certainly be realigning back to what Mark said earlier. You know, you have to then, you know, get an amicable appraisal or an evaluation of the firm to have both parties amicably agree that either A, the shareholders agreement in place does stack up in the current market environment and B, how does the exiting partner want to exit with the employee? From the vendor 
uh, sorry, from the partner's point of view, the typical things I say to them is has or can the employee, be that the manager or whoever it might be, um, uh, farm or um, fish. So, you know, it's the old saying, you know, some people are really good at keeping clients happy but can't find new clients, whereas some are really good at yeah. finding new clients but can't keep them. So do they have the ability? Yeah. Mm. No, it's really important. That's why you said complementary skill sets yeah. um, uh, are critical to a good partnership yeah. as well. I mean, just yes. I mean, just back to your your question as well, Michael, with, you know, the 30-year-old being tapped on the shoulder, the most important conversation he's going to have in that process is not with the part, the exiting partner who's tapping him on the shoulder. It's with the other three partners that are staying. You know, what yeah. is it? what is it that the three of you are looking to achieve for the next, you know, five, ten years? And how does that align with what I want to achieve personally? And then also as well, you know, how's the decision-making process going to work as well? Because presumably, you know, Especially. in a situation like that where as the individual, you know, you haven't got a majority share, you know, mm. it's one thing to feel, you know, some people want to become an, you know, an equity partner for um, clearly they feel that they want to get a good return out of it. But another part of it is to actually have that sense of being a business owner and making the decisions that actually drive the business. So understanding the decision making process uh, which typically is not always transparent until you actually get to that partnership level to me would be a key part of that process as well and you know being able to look at all of those other three in the eye and go C -c do you actually think you can work with these people are you comfortable you can sit down and make decisions with these people you know it's e it's easy in the good times but when there comes a challenging period you know are these the people you you, you know you want to be sort of uh colloquially speaking in bed with yep no, no, 100% true. Yeah. Um, the transparency and the the different holdings of equity and how that's kind yeah. of thrown around in terms of weight at the board meetings. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's definitely key. And probably an exit strategy um, in the contracts and an agreement if things don't work out between us well, especially if there's fees involved or brought on board um, to make sure there's a smooth exit there as well. Um, so look, thank you for that. Now, I guess going back to your expertise you guys and i was really you know excited about speaking with you because you have such a broad exposure to the industry and speak to so many firms all the time uh, and I imagine there's so many accountants grappling with a lot of changes in the short period of time and dealing with distressed clients and figuring out how to charge and navigate constantly changing legislation um, i guess seeing what's happening during this uncertain times of COVID. From your business or M&A perspective, um, what are you seeing happening in the market at the moment? Um, in you know whether it could be in terms of the, the level of activity, the surprising things that you've seen, unusual things, um, volume-wise. What what are you seeing happening in the market right now? Yeah, well, look at the first point. I would say um, when COVID nineteen hit, we did see a dramatic pause in March with um, buyers. Um, for the first couple of weeks. But what we then started to see once the initial phase of COVID-19 took place was, you know, we would typically see on average, you know, 25 to 35 um, interested parties wanting to see one of our clients that, you know, is newly listed. And what we were seeing was that was, that was dramatically lower, you know, around the five to 10. Um, and it slowly started to build back up. But what we noticed in that stage was that it, it, it did eradicate some of the firms that might have been looking to buy another firm. Um, we didn't see them coming through and inquiring. What we saw was people that owned firms that were still, you know, operating well through the, the COVID-19 dilemma, but also had the ability to buy another accounting firm. So it did carve out a lot of those firms that might have been sitting on the fence and just what we were seeing were people coming through still very serious about buying. So, you know, back in March and then in April, um, we're working with firms like that and literally um, selling accounting firms still. Um, it wasn't at the same rate and same intensity as um, it was in the normal era before COVID-19. But I should add, we fast forward to just last week and we feel like things are back to normal. We had a, a listing of a firm with roughly half a million dollars in turnover, and we're currently sitting at 33 interested parties. So it, we did see the, the V or the U shape that the economists were referring to taking place within, the, uh, within our own industry. 
um, where there was a, a level of silence, but then it slowly crept back up to now what we're seeing is normal numbers of interested parties. So, yeah, it was really fascinating to, just to see that happen over that period of time. Of course, you know, we stayed open and, and, and had a lot of Zoom meetings with our clients and people interested in buying them um, and still traded through it. So, I think I, th I think the the interesting dynamic though which is probably just worth spending a minute on here because i think there's a, there's been a, well it's actually been a couple of different dynamics at play over the last couple of months so i think there's the there's the uncertainty element michael which you which you referenced and mm -hmm. you know there's that level of uncertainty you know is impacting across the whole economy not just within the accounting industry but i think the specific um factor within the accounting industry that we've seen probably have the biggest impact over the last couple of months is just the sheer level of activity that accounting firms have had to undertake specifically helping clients get their heads around and then process job keeper pain so you know through march and april i would say the biggest the biggest reason we probably saw that you know, slow down in M and A activity that Daniel referred to w w was less about people suddenly going, "Well, I wanted to sell back in February, or I wanted to buy back in February, and now I don't." But they were suddenly they were suddenly going from you know normal levels of activity to almost a hundred and fifty percent level of activity working through JobKeeper. Yep. So you know, we 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 went through a you know a couple of weeks, and you know our deliberate strategy, as Daniel you know Daniel was saying, was you know, let's stay close, close to clients, close to the market, close to, you know, keep talking to people. But, you know, there's a few weeks where it was really difficult to get a hold of anybody. And not because they didn't want to talk to us, you know, when we eventually did, they said, oh, you know, we've just come up for air because we've been handling all the JobKeeper piece. So I, th I actually think that was probably more the, the bigger factor in terms of this sort of dip we saw that we've now seen sort of, you know, bounce back you know, obviously, since you know all the JobKeeper sort of applications are in now, and that's coincided with what we've seen as this, you know, good bounce back in activity. Yeah, yeah. No, I think I agree with you. We've experienced probably the same in recruitment, where in March there's a lot of sort of knee jerk reactions. I mean, a lot of our retainers were cancelled or put on pause. Um, so you know, for for partners and senior managers. And now the last week to two weeks, I would say we've also had um, clients calling us back saying, hey, you know, recruitment freeze is finished. Um, we're back to looking and actually, you know, things are kind of business as usual. Most our staff are coming back to work, et cetera. Mm. So no, 100% agree with you. Um, the, the, and we've had the same issue. <laughs> Trying to get partners on the phone has been a struggle. Um, and they're saying, look, we're working 13, 14 hour days, you know, nonstop. So I, I can see where you're, where you're coming from there. Um, have you seen, I guess, an, an impact or do you envisage an impact on sort of valuations or deal structure given COVID? I think in terms of valuations, no. Um, what we've seen is probably more deal structures where what's being discussed is a longer retention period, just given the uncertainty mm -hmm. on some of the industries that may be in the accounting firm client base that's for sale, um, which is natural and, and, and agreeable because there's still some uncertainty on, you know, the travel and tourism industry and other industries like that that have been heavily impacted. But that also depends on what the client base is like within the accounting firm. Um, it, cause you, it, it's hard to speculate when you're looking to value an accounting firm on something that hasn't transpired other than COVID-19 has transpired, but there's still uncertainty as to what the outcome is going to be of it. I think there's obvious, there's some obviously there's going to be some businesses impacted, but they haven't, well, some might have, but some are still potentially and some might potentially and then not. So what we've been seeing is less of the deterioration on the value of an accounting firm because an accounting firm, as it stacks up, is, is quite a strong business. I mean, in terms of just looking at it in its raw entity and its raw industry against other businesses in other industries, um, it does have recurring revenue and it does have a strong relationship with its clients. So it is, and in this market, it's even more so now, as you just heard Mark rightly say, um, with, you know, what they've been experiencing and the massive rush of clients wanting to speak to their accountant about different elements of stimulus packages from the government. So 
No to the valuation, but deal structure, yes. And probably looking at it more on instead of the traditional 12 months, I want to retire. It's probably been deemed more around the 18 to 24 months looking to retire. Um, but we've been in some ways fortunate because a lot of our clients that we're currently working through the process and finishing off the sale agreements with have actually um, look to not sell the business and retire within 12 months, but are looking to sell their business and stay on board for three plus years. So that's instantly eradicated the, um, the issue. Well, a lot, Why is people, that? A, lot what, of, a lot of people now are coming to us earlier on in the piece of their succession plan. Um, we saw it over the last, we've yeah. seen it sort of transpire the last couple of years, a trend where no longer is an owner of a practice saying, yep, Now's the time for me to get out and I've got six to 12 months to get out. They're coming to us a lot earlier on in the piece um, and say, and asking questions and, and picking our brain and then starting to realize their own strategy and how that could evolve. Um, others are looking at it as a successful transition rather than a straight out exit. So, ex, you know, a transition over three to five. And in some cases, we've got one, 10 years. Uh, actually, two we have, sorry. Um, so yeah, people are looking at it in a longer term view than a shorter term view now. Okay. So even 10 years, people are actually coming up to saying, I want to sell my firm now and retain some sort of consulting salary. Yeah, I mean, it, position I mean, it, can, for the next 10 it, it years. can happen for lo lots of different reasons. I mean, what, you know, we've got an example at the moment of a, of a guy who's 43. You know, he's quickly grown a mm. practice, but he's got it to a point of where he's saying, you know, my clients expect me to be the expert of everything. And plus, I'm, you know, find I'm wearing, you know, 15 different hats. So, you know, in this particular case, you know, ideally what he's looking for is a merger rather than an outright sale. But he said, you know, I'm still 43. Yep. I don't want to, I don't want to stop working. I've got another 10 years to go. But, you know, I actually want to sort of, you know, merge into a, another firm and keep going with, uh, with greater support and freeing me up to, you know, spend more time doing the things that I enjoy doing and that I'm very good at. So, I mean, I mean, it, you know, it is a cliche, but if you line up 10 different deals, every single one will be different, you know? Yeah. Everyone's got different. Yeah. That's exactly right. Motivation. Yeah. I was, I was interested, like I was reflecting, um, on your comment in terms of retention and our periods and just sort of seeing potential fallouts from the COVID situation. Um, and one is what you mentioned before, which is depending on the demographics of the client base, where there's a lot of, say, retail or hospitality clients or travel clients, um, how, you know, obviously some of those clients will be distressed or won't survive. So that will be a, a drop in recurring revenue next year, um, let alone, well, collections will be an issue slash recurring revenue next year. Um, and how that would affect sort of the earnout periods and earnout percentage structure. Um, but then I think the other interesting thing is because there's been so much reliance on accountants for advice with all the constantly changing job keeper, job seeker, you know, um, legislative support things, both state and national. Um, if some accountants either were pretty lax with the compliance and, you know, clients didn't end up qualifying for some of the help and support or they're not, they haven't been available or haven't made themselves available for clients and clients feel kind of a bit disenchanted with the service levels, uh, whether that would dramatically affect retention for, for some firms. Um, so yeah, I was just reflecting on that today and just curious whether you think, you know, that would be, or how much of an impact that would have on your typical accounting practice that normally didn't have to deal with such stress basically and so much pressure on them to deliver a customer service, but also, you know, their accounting yeah. service as well. Um, yeah, it's, a, it, it, it's a really interesting question. I mean, whilst, whilst I guess the current situation with COVID-19 is a, is a driver of it, but what it talks to at a more fundamental level is how well run is the practice and how strong are the client relationships? And is this a, you know, a proactive firm that is close to its client or is it, or is it a reactive firm that's, you know, been a little bit complacent? Um, and, and I do think my sense is that COVID-19, you know, in the same way as I was sort of referencing, you, you know, online arrivals in the travel industry, you know, what it does is it flushes out the good organizations become stronger and the ones that have been a little bit more complacent probably get weaker. And, you know, we've, I think as you pointed out earlier, you know, we've spent a lot of time talking to an awful lot of accounting firms over the last couple of months and, 
you know, we we hear numerous stories where, you know, the, the, the more proactive ones have all recognized that, you know, this COVID-19 situation is a key moment of truth for their clients. So they've really stepped up to the plate. They've been very proactive in working with their clients. And, and quite a few of the firms we've spoken to have said, well, we've actually, we've been surprised. We've actually been picking up clients because some of our, you know, local competitors, it almost seems like that they've gone the opposite way uh, and shut up shop and gone into into hibernation. Now, if you're the client of that sort of mm. accounting firm, you know, you got to go, well, where were you guys in one moment of truth? So, um, you know, I, th I think it will come down to individual firms. But what wouldn't surprise me is if, you know, buyers are taking a much closer look at what specifically happened with your firm over these three months. You know, were you picking up clients? Were you losing clients? You know, how how did you respond? And that, that, that would be a really good indicator of the overall health of the client and of the accounting firm. And as you say, that then has implications around the, you know, level of retention that gets agreed between the parties. No, oh, 100%. Because I, I think what you said before, like reactive versus proactive. And I've seen, I mean, accountants generally are kind of in those two categories, but I think COVID will make it a lot clearer with who is in which category mm. for a lot of the clients, um, especially a small business. You know, they generally talk to each other. They seeing what each accountant mm. does for them. Um, you know, at, originally at the pub, now probably on a Zoom meeting or by phone. Um, but, you know, and I can imagine a lot of older practitioners that would just struggle to cope, especially sole practitioners would just shut up shop and just say, look, I've had enough. You know, I, I think this is my uh, my time to, to show the talent mm. and close up shop. Um, I don't know whether you've seen that happen or, or heard of that happening sort of over the last couple of weeks or not, but I, w I would imagine. No, that I mean, we, we've some. heard of firms where they've literally, and, and, you know, when I said shut up, shut, I didn't literally mean sort of permanently, but almost like they've sort of, you know, temporarily gone into hibernation themselves, um, which, which, which to me is quite a, you know, would be quite an odd thing to do when your clients really need you. I mean, we, we haven't had anyone come to us in the last sort of six weeks and said, you know, oh my God, this, you know, this situation's too much. It's tipped me over the edge. I need to sell and get out quickly. We, we haven't seen any of that. Um, Although yeah. we have, we have. Well, I think anyone, anyone that had a firm worth selling yeah. probably yeah. wouldn't say that though. Uh, well, sorry, would, no. wouldn't do that. Well, they might uh, say that to yeah. us. Yes, they might say that to market. us, but yes, we wouldn't <laughs> say that to the market, clearly. Yeah, I think what we have seen, though, Michael, is some yeah. people that were considering it and now have gone through all this. And it's not untypical for us to be having conversations of owners with firms leading into the end of the financial year. But, you know, if you could appreciate someone might have been considering the idea at the end of this financial year, wanting to set up shop to sell it and get out and retire... Um, and going through this COVID pandemic, I think that's probably cemented their idea of doing it. But what Mark said is mm. rightly true. What they've then realised is, well, geez, if I'm going to do this, I can't go quiet with my clients because they're the ones that give me the value in my business. So I better get on the front foot and make sure they're all happy. So, you know, email, marketing, communication, phone calls is what we've seen these people do to ensure their clients are okay and not going anywhere. But what's been fascinating for me just to listen to is how they've done that and as Mark said, some of these firms that went into hibernation have lost clients to these firms that have been actually doing this. And it's just been a surprise because the client's been in distress and can't get a hold of their accountant. So what do you think they do? They ask their next their next people that they know in their network and they say, yeah, well, my accountant's been proactively speaking to me about all these things. Have a chat to him. Yeah. It's got, it's got me a job keeper. It's got me this. It's got me that. I've got, got money coming in from all the levels of government. wasn't one of those that allowed people to um, be able to breach the super funds and get the uh, information. But yeah, otherwise, yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. And I guess what advice would you give to firms looking to, to sell what right now? What advice would we give to firms looking to sell right now? Um, the first thing is consider the reason. Um, of why. So one of the first things Mark and, I, Mark and I do is we we always ask the question, you know, why are you looking to sell? Um, and to be honest, nine out of 10 times, it's because of retirement. And that's great because that's logical. So have that clear in their head that, you know, why are yep. you looking to sell now? And be firm that you've made that decision to sell. Um, it's quite painful for us and for also buyers to have someone sitting on the fence saying they want to sell, but they're unsure. Um, because all it, all it will do is just prolong the inevitable until such time as they're ready. So 
be comfortable in their own skin that they're ready to sell their practice um, and hand the reins over. The other things, is, as we touched on earlier, is this things around consider who would be or what would be the ideal fit of you know your practice being taken over by someone. Um, whilst you're talking to a shadow, and often Mark and I find ourselves having to explain a ghost to the to the client looking to sell their practice, um, it, it's always good to try and appreciate. Well, as Mark touched on earlier, you know what's the values and what's the vision and what's the culture that you would you know that defines your firm. In essence, it helps us understand their firm and them understand who the right ideal fit might be. Um, the, the third thing I would do is look at the key things that drive the value of your business. You know, whip debtors, lock up days, profit before and after partner salaries. Um, you know, all these elements, you know, age of your client demographics and location and services and all these elements are, are key elements to what drives the value of their, of their business. Um, and then, and, and then, yeah, and then work from there. Okay. What would you say a firm can do to maximize their valuation? They should have done the sale value. They should have done it five years ago, to be honest. (laughs) So there's nothing a firm could do, say, six months. Say they approach you and they say, look, we're looking to sell. Have you ever gone back to a firm and said, look, do A, B, and C? Let's put in the market six months time when we see the numbers. To be honest with that, six months is probably too short. I mean, you know, if you take the view of a buyer, you know, and even us when we look at doing an appraisal, um, if there's a sudden spike in the year that they're selling, you know, that raises a red flag as to, well, why did it suddenly spike and now you're selling? Wouldn't you want to stay in the business? So in essence, it has to be something developed over two, a minimum two years to, to deem it sustainable by the buyer's, by, by, through the buyer's lens. Um, so realistically, yeah, that's why I said, you know, at least five years ago, because, you know, a buyer and us, we want to see the last five year five years of profit and loss to see the trends. So, you know, if, if, if then to come back to your question then, so if, if a buyer, sorry, if a seller is looking to exit, have that vision in mind that if you're looking to, to sell, you, you, you should be at least at a minimum looking five years before you want to and doing things within your business to, like I touched on with those key performance indicators, to improve them. Uh, so that's that's my take on it mm. because what we've seen typically over the years is that's the market's take on it as well. Uh, it's the bank's take on it, and it's also we've got two independent evaluation firms now. That's their take on it too. So there is consistency in that. How typical is that though? The firms are that proactive with boosting their numbers five years ahead of time, or even three to five years ahead of time. Yeah, I mean, look, it's a it's an interesting one because it's a little bit all over the place. I mean, we get people coming to us with fantastic operationally fantastic firms, and we get them independently uh, valued. Because, you know, they've done the right thing and built a very good, great, sustainable business that operates very well and drives year on year growth, revenue growth. Um, so they're, they're probably the minority. The majority we get are firms that haven't probably taken a, 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 a better lens at the vision of their succession plan and have probably decided at that point in time to retire. That could be through knee jerk reactions of health, family matters, or um, whatever that like, you know, whatever, whatever happens in life, um, that yeah. brings them to us. And we obviously look at it from a, from that point of view. So it, it's a bit of a mixed bag. I can't say every, I can't give you like an actual total because it, they are all human yeah. and they all have different reasons why <laughs> it's not like it's computer generated. Yeah. So, but, but the takeaway from what you were saying before is. You know, fortunately or unfortunately, you are dealing with accountants and you're dealing with smart, you know, analytical numbers focused people. So unlike business sales in, in other industries where, you know, it's very common to boost or spike in numbers six to 12 months before sale, um, you know, in accounting, as you said, like people look at three, four, five years um, trends and, you know, doing anything last minute isn't really going to make a difference. So, you know, if, I think that the biggest takeaway is being a lot more proactive and, and even having conversations with, with you guys, yeah. um, you know, five years from retirement and seeing what you Mark be always asks a really good question for the next five years. I've come to like and appreciate myself, and that is what have they done to um, help with the transition of their clients within their current business? 
And what the question's alluding to is around, you know, the senior accountant or the manager, like what level of client facing meetings do they have and what level of engagement do they have with their their clients that gives them the ability to be able to um uh hit to, to, to transition. So yeah, I would consider things like that that would most certainly help um and uh and and go from there. Okay. What about on the flip side? What advice would you give to buyers um, right now? Well, Mark, I've yeah, got a text for him saying he, he can't, we can't hear him. <laughs> um, but we'll, we'll see how we go with that. But um, uh, the buyers, I would say, be empathetic is the is the common goal, and 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 have a good reason as to why they would want to buy an accounting firm. I think the the critical mistake that we often see is that. Um, Buyers tend to be so heavily focused on what it is that they want to achieve and making sure that they get a, a positive rate of return, which is understandable, I might add, but they lose sight of what's the purpose of the person sitting the opposite the table to them and what's the reason why they're selling. So purpose can often be things around making sure that the client staff are happily transitioned over to the buyer's firm um, and reason could be cancer. So if they're not empathetic to that, they could be completely disregarded as an opportunity from a cultural fit. So the empathetic side of them will need to really shine in the initial stages. Otherwise, they just won't get an, uh, another opportunity at it. And as I said before, you know, don't for a minute think that it's just going to be them sitting opposite the table of that owner of that practice wanting to sell. It's a seller's market. I mean... <laughs> They really have to be appreciative and empathetic to the seller because they're not the minority, the seller is. Mm. Mm. I mean, you did mention 20 to 30 um, potential suitors per, per transaction. Mm. Yeah, we, we, we often phenomenal. use the word commitment um, on both sides, actually, when, when buyers or sellers are asking us about, you know, the secret of success because, you know, as a seller, it's one thing to say, I want to sell my business, but then you've got to be incredibly committed to that process when we're then working with them saying, you know, as the example we've just had recently, you know, we've had 35 people express interest in the first 10 days. You know, we've spoken to all of them and there's, you know, there's at least eight of them that we think are potentially a good fit that would like to meet you. So as a seller, you've got to be ready on the ball. And equally as a buyer, you know, if you're one of those 35 you've got to be committed to the process as well. You've got to be really focused and on the ball in those in that first meeting with the vendor. Um, and if you think there's a, an interested deal there, you, absolutely, as Daniel said, you've got to express the right level of empathy and walk in the seller's shoes. But you've got to be prepared to move quickly as well. Or someone else will, and they'll beat you to it. Mm. How long are firms, current, well, on average, sort of the last 12 months? Um, and I'm curious whether that will change with hesitancy right now. Um, how long are firms usually on the market? Yeah, it's a, it, it's a really good question. I mean, it, it is honestly like a, you know, if you, if you could picture a, 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 you know, a normal distribution curve. I mean, I think the short the shortest one between being advertised and going to a heads of agreement was probably about 20 days, you know, and we've had others that go up to 12 months or more. But, mm -hmm. you, you know, the, the majority would sit in the middle and you yep. think within, you know, four to seven months, um, you know, they've locked, they've locked down the deal. Yeah. That's still a lengthy process in general, four to seven months yeah. on average. No, what, what it is, but it, but equally it comes down okay. to, you know, if you think about some of the things we said, it, it's not like selling a car where, you, you know, you find someone, you agree the price and off you go. Typically, you know, as Daniel was mentioning earlier, we're seeing the vendors having longer transition. So there, there is more of a journey around people getting to know each other and, and actually understand, that, you know, is this someone I can then go and work with for the next, you know, could be 12 months, could mm. be two years, could be three years. You know, is this a home that I want, uh, uh, you know, my people and my clients and my legacy uh, to basically be be looked after by, and you know they've still got businesses to run at the same time. So um, look, it, it is a long time. But the worst thing people can do is uh, you know have a meeting with someone, think everything's fantastic, and rush into a contract. You know we always advise don't do that. You know you know stick to the process and trust the process to get to a good outcome. I can I can add to that that it's not like buying most... a house. Sorry, go on. It's surprising how often we hear buyers say. Well, it's just like buying a house, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, 
I'm curious from your perspective that you, that you I guess, once again, on average, um, where do you see the emphasis from the sellers? Is it more towards dollars or is it more towards fit? We like the ones that are more emphasis on fit. <laughs> mm. um, we get a little bit concerned internally when it's more about the dollars um, because, to be frank, it's mm. the wrong attitude. They are selling goodwill, so they are selling clients that use them as their accountant to another accounting firm. So we prefer to see sellers that are looking to make sure that it's a good fit for the clients and the staff. And then what we always say is what will naturally progress to that through that process is a good commercial and money outcome, monetary outcome mm. for them. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, the deals that tend to work well, and what I mean by work well is that, you know, 12 months and two years later, the vendor has successfully transitioned and exited. You know, the buyer's still got the clients, the buyer's still got the people on board, you know, and everything's going well. Uh, are the deals where there isn't a winner and a loser, but both parties feel like they've got a good deal out of it? Yeah. So, so, that so, so that's, that, that's generally the majority of the time. So what, so, so what you're trying to look for, coming back to your, to your question... Okay. You know, we've seen examples where a seller's been faced with or had the opportunity of, you know, five or six prospective buyers, all of whom are keen to move forward and make a deal. Now, if you were selling your house or your car in that situation, you'd probably try and conjure up a bit of a bidding war and push the price up. That's not something we typically see here because the vendor, even mm -hmm. though there might be half a dozen willing to obtain an offer, the vendors generally got their preference to go, well, I actually, you know, my preferred buyer is this person because I think they're going to do the right thing with my clients, the right thing with my people. And frankly, they're the one I think I'll be able to work with best, you know, over the next 12, 12 to 18 months. So that takes some of the, the pressure off, you know, an, up, an upward, uh, you know, reflection of the price. So it doesn't turn into a bidding war. It actually says, right, they're my favorite. So now let's go and construct a deal that we're both happy with. The reason I'm asking is I'm curious to give you, well, let's do a scenario to, to nut it out. Say you've got a firm that's for sale, looking to sell. They've got a buyer that they love and they think would be an amazing fit. But due to either financing restrictions, personal circumstances, or their perspective on how much the firm should be valued, say they offer 90, 95 cents in a dollar. Um, you've got another one that, you know, very commercially run, well run, but like fit wise, probably not the best, but they're offering a dollar ten. <laughs> what what's the buy? What do you, I guess how would the buyer generally react to something like that? Um, from your experience and, and we've been in that situation, that situation in similar context to what you just said then, Michael. Um, and what was fascinating for us to see, but also to discuss with the our client who was selling their firm was what's the cultural fit worth? Because that can be your headache that could talk to the future, which you can't put a monetary value on. But you can certainly say causes a lot of stress and a lot of yeah. sleepless nights. Um, and when you break it down into numbers, is it you know, what's the value of an additional 50 grand worth to you, knowing that you've got the right person sitting in front of you that's not going to keep you up at night and you're not going to be able to trust, you know, is 50 grand worth it? That's the very first question we ask because greed never wins in any of these things, right? That's the thing I always say to myself and to others that if you're trying to generate an extra buck out of this, whether it's a buyer or a seller, you're just going to lose because you're losing perspective on why you should be doing it. And that is to be able to get, as Mark said, an equally weighted deal where you're not going to have sleepless nights over it and you're going to be able to trust that other person that's taking on your business. And from a buyer's perspective, you're going to know you've got trust in the seller not wanting to do something wrong by you. So that then leads to further yeah. conversations around, well, okay, if it's $50,000 difference, being open and transparent with the right party saying, look, you are the right party, but look, there's a 50 grand difference between your offer and another. Is there something that we can do where, coming back to Mark's point, both parties are gaining something but also losing something too so that there's equal weight I liken it to the, you know, the thing that sits on the judge's table in the court, the the, the scales. We always try and make sure that those two scales are even yeah. when it gets to the heads of agreement and the contract being signed. Because if they're not, whoever side it's leading to is going to force, is going to be leaving a bad taste in the other person's mouth. Do you know what I mean? So whether it's, yeah, 
And that's to be honest with you, Michael. That scares us because factor. if we know that there's a transaction going forward where either the buyer or seller has a really bitter taste in their mouth, we instantly know that there's risk in that deal, and that concerns us because it's a small market yeah. and word bad news travels faster than good, and we don't want to have our brand attached to something that went bad. So we we we're quite transparent with both parties in that situation to say don't. Don't leave. Don't don't think that by leaving something on the table is a good thing. Be be open with each other and talk about how you what you're feeling that you can actually both nut out. And that's a good that's a good sentiment for what they're going to be faced with if they are going to do a transaction together because it's not going to be smooth sailing and they are going to be hitting. They are going to be incurring hurdles that they're going to need to overcome. So it's a good it's a good indicator on how they achieve that. Yeah, true. Um, so like like any relationship, right? Husband and wife. I mean, the the ability to positively discuss and uh, I guess the, res the ability to resolve conflicts and differences um, probably speaks volumes yeah. into the longevity of the relationship. We certainly don't want to be the Tinder the, of the market. Like how harmonious it will be. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. That could be your future. No, no, Maybe no, that's an no, app that's worth investing in. That's, no, that's a flat note. <laughs> um, I was curious as well, you mentioned four to seven months. Is there a, uh, from a practical perspective for, for listeners, what could be done to speed that up or what are the things to avoid that generally hold things up yeah i mean so i mean Could something that does that? hold things up is what, what, the point i came back to earlier commitment so if i you know so again using mm. an example you know if you're if you say you want to sell you've got to be ready to create time in your diary but also mentally the headspace to sit down engage with respective buyers and actually make decisions so you know we have you know we've worked we've worked with clients you know the first thing they'll say to a buyer is oh, by, by the way i'm going to rush now some people may think that's a sort of a negotiating <laughs> tactic but what the buyers here is well hang on you know i might potentially wasting my time here and i'll go and look to yeah they're not serious i'll go and focus on someone yeah, else you're not serious suddenly six months later they're still they're wondering why they haven't sold the business so you, you know that commitment and availability piece um can be a huge can be a huge driver um, how do you guys judge that when you're sitting across from a client that wants to sell it and they say all the right things because i've got the same issue of candidates right or clients they, they say all the right things but when it comes to actually you know yeah. pulling the trigger it's a very different story how do you i guess what what have you guys come up with as um, key identifying factors that yeah. give you a bit of confidence yeah. that this person well, is? I mean, we, we get know, a pretty early warning through. sign before they've gone to market because the first thing we do with a client that sold up, uh, that, that signed up with us is we have to prepare a detailed info memora information memorandum about the business. And, you know, so typically how that works mm -hmm. is we'll send them a checklist of information and it's quite a comprehensive checklist because our memorandum has evolved over time based on typical questions that come back from buyers at that stage of the deal process so that we, we know now that you know 90 yep. percent of cases when a buyer reads that memorandum they've got everything they need to progress through to the you know the next stage of the deal process but you know sometimes vendors will look at that information and go oh there's a bit of work there and suddenly, you know, a week goes by and two weeks go by and three weeks go by, you know, sometimes four weeks go by and, and, you know, we're sort of talking to them going, you know, how are you going with that information? And, you know, so suddenly it's, well, look, I've been busy and I haven't had time and da, 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 da. and those, those are the sorts of early warning signs that they're perhaps not as serious mm. as what they said they were at the start of the process, you know. And, and again, you know, when you meet, yep. you know, the vendors that do best, you know, they're, they're on top of that information. They provide it promptly when they're presented with, you know, we track all of our deals and sit down with our clients, you know, typically each week and say, you know, here are the, you know, here are the people that's interest. You know, these ones have seen this information memorandum and these people are interested in talking further and we spoke to them and we think they're fit. You know, the ones that are, you know, very quickly, it's obvious when people are going, right, you know, I've got, I'm going to keep next Tuesday free. I'm happy to meet a bunch of respected buyers, you know, and then at the other end of the spectrum, they'll say, well, look, I'm happy to meet one in the week and the week after. That's when you know they need a bit of coaching, you know, you <laughs> coach them through the process because, you know, yep. once the buyer is interested, reality they, you want to keep the momentum. Otherwise, they, they do lose interest and move on to the next thing. 100%. I was curious, um, especially in, in the current environment, how does a mix of advisory versus compliance 
impact on the valuations and sort of attractiveness of a, of a practice. With the sorry, mine just cut out there. What was that? Sorry. Um, I was curious, especially given the current environment, how the mix of advisory versus compliance work in you know, a firm. Um, how does that impact the relations of attractiveness? It's an interesting of question, firm, isn't it? Because buying. we so often hear in the market, compliance is dead and advisory is key. Uh, what we find fascinating in the M&A exactly. space is that advisory is fought with danger and compliance is key. Um, <laughs> it's exactly why I'm asking because I, I I spoke to a couple of clients now and there's the ones have been in the industry for a long time and they were reminiscing about sort of the lessons learned from the GFC times where, you know, they were like pounding in their chest that we've like, got 40 50 percent of our fee base is advisory now we're doing really well um but then as soon as the gfc hit they were like wiped out um because that just that sort of work dries up overnight um obviously depending on the type of advisor but it, you know it was heavily affected so now that they learned their lessons and they made sure there's plenty of compliance work with the right type of clients um which is why i was really curious well what, the first yeah, thing what is what, what is the, the advisory is. services that the firm's doing. So if the advisory services is traditional and by traditional tax planning, cash flow forecasting and um, business analysis things, and the buyer can see that they have the ability to be able to manage and take on that service, then it's fine. It's great. It's a, it's a good outcome. If it's out of, out of that norm and specific to an industry or a service type that the buyer has never done before, then there's a problem because that buyer effectively can't continue to take on that service line. So it does to some extent, depending on how specific the advisory service is, it will lend itself more to what level of buyer can or can't take it on. So, you know, what we do traditionally see though is things around, they call it like um, firms have come to us selling that they've got clients paying a monthly fixed fee that includes the bookkeeping, a little bit of tax planning, um, some services around, uh, sorry, and, um, you know, the year end accounts being completed and the tax returns for the individuals and the company or partnership being lodged, that they might include a little bit of advice in that. In, in that. That's something that we traditionally see is what we see some firms calling business advisory services. Um, you know, it, when it goes a little bit beyond that, it can be things around mm -hmm. a quarterly catch up on the cash flow analysis and forecast and three way cash flow forecasting and all these sort of wonderful things which are out there. We don't typically see too much of that with um, our firms that are coming to us, probably because they're of an older demographic and um, they're inundated with the compliance work already. So they don't have the freedom to be able to do that service. We do see that typically in some cases with the buyers because they're, been a, they're a lot more energetic and they want to grow, and hence the reason why they're talking to us about buying an accounting firm. Uh, but yeah, that, hopefully that can become a little concept yeah. around what we're seeing with advisory services. I think, I, I, I think the other piece that you were saying before, sorry, go on. That the buyers look at is the sort of regularity of the business advisory fees. So, you know, an individual piece of business advisory work for the client may not necessarily repeat, but if there's a consistent pattern of this firm being able to generate one-off business advisory work with client, you know, the positive, there's a positive in that that can be reflected valuation. And, and it's indicative that, you know, the firm is probably has a better mm. understanding and closer to its clients than, than one that does purely compliance. Yeah. You were saying before, Daniel, like uh, the the perspective is like advisory is kind of fraught with danger and compliance. Absolutely, some would compliance say is, dead is, is what's actually deemed necessity on the and reoccurring. Advisory is deemed on top of that. Some argue is reoccurring, but when times get tough, what do you think is the first service that gets cut? Yep. So it's an interesting advisory dilemma and one that I've always chuffed and laughed at because I don't see compliance going away. And if you just look at what we discussed earlier about COVID nineteen. Compliance, as Mark said, over 150% of capacity and work. Mm. So um, in this new world and in this new age, I know their systems and I've been a part of those software companies that have been spruiking their software and saying it's a good thing. At the end of the day, if you can automate compliance to the best of your ability, uh, that's, that's a feat in its own right. You know, that's a difficult thing just to get right at the start. Yeah. Um, another interesting point like uh, that, that's on everyone's mind is 
outsourcing. Some firms outsource, some don't, some outsource to a degree. Um, I've got candidates that refuse to work at firms that outsource, for example, uh, and I've had that happen multiple times, even though, you know, I see a lot of benefit in it. Can you speak a little bit about your experience in terms of a, how does it affect, you know, the, the buying selling dynamic and valuation? Yeah, well, I can start if you like, Mark. Um, the first thing I would say is that with outsourcing, it's existed in the industry since day dot. Um, it's not a new concept. Uh, accountants have always outsourced to other accountants, whether it's through specialized work, audit, um, uh, are two common examples, right? Um, and even more so today with, uh, you know, the level of work that needs to be done. The, the typical thing we see with outsourcing is it does take a lot of effort to set up. Um, it's not like a 12 month runway and then it's up and running. Once it's done appropriately though, and identified within the business as to what is being outsourced and they, the, the firm gets that up and running, um, the profit starts to increase naturally. Um, and then we start to see the client, the, the firms being able to do more with their time that they've got back, um, such as, you know, adding additional services like advice to their clients. Um, being able to take on more work um, in greater volumes with not as many staff required um, because outsourcing raises its question to what is the right structure of an accounting firm today? How many staff do you need? If you do have one partner generating or controlling $1 million in revenue is like the average rule of thumb. How many staff do they need under that? How many staff is required under that one partner? No one really has the magical answer to that because there's so many different ways to complete it through outsourcing or having it internally. I wouldn't say though that outsourcing mm. on the horizon is going to be as needed in the future. I think the trend I'm personally seeing is with software developing, there is going to be a greater extent of work not needing to be done in such a difficult way and more in an automated way. So. There is a question mark on the future of outsourcing, not so much on will or won't it exist, but how will it exist? The 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 other thing I would add, mm. Michael, That's I think if you're really if you're a firm that outsources and then you're coming to sell, I think everything else being equal, you are going to appear more complicated to a buyer that doesn't outsource that now that's not to say that you shouldn't have outsourced in the mm -hmm. first place but obviously a firm that understands outsourcing and gets outsourcing and and embraces it as part of their business strategy is probably going to find it a lot easier to integrate ability outsource than, than one that doesn't yeah yeah that makes yeah. sense um no, really really good point guys um and i like the fact that you said that mm. you know you might actually see a reversal of the trend because of the increase in automation and technology i guess because yeah you're right a lot of the outsourcing is yeah for the mental I think, stuff i think that probably, probably without being automated getting into the semantics it, it's the offshoring piece probably the key um sort of complication in that process as, as daniel said you know accountants have been out in various parts of their of their business for years yeah that i think that i should probably yeah i should i should have rephrased offshoring rather than outsourcing you're right um guys is there anything else you would like to add because i know we've kind of gone a little bit over time um any other gems or anything that you feel would create a light bulb moment Mark, happy you to go first. <laughs> yeah look I, I think i mean again my i mean my my overall advice would be to any firm whether you're thinking to buy or sell you know start with the why and be really clear on your why and then everything else will follow from that you know if you're not if you're not clear on the why then you're probably ready yeah and to expand on the why is that will give reference to what makes okay. you different in the other nearly 65,000 other accounting firms across Australia. As a best guess, I don't know how many there are, to be honest. <laughs> Why, as Mark said, makes you different. Mm. It's going to be 25 to 35 other people sitting across the table yeah. from that okay. firm that's looking to sell. Why you? So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 I, 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 and Especially sorry, as you said, I'm in the sales market, 100%. One more that triggered a thought after Daniel said that. You know, we, you were asking earlier, Michael, around, you know, what can firms do to know, pump up everything else? I think, you know, ultimately, if you're a seller, you know, it, it can be, it can sound very easy on a piece of paper to go, right, you know, I'm going to come up with the perfect plan. I'm going to get my business looking in, you know, the absolute best possible shape to sell. 
you know, life doesn't actually work like that. And at some point, you know, if you're feeling in the broader context of your why that now's the right time, then it probably is the right time to push a button. And similarly, on the buyer's side, you know, we, we ran a webinar recently with, say, um, uh, a, the partner of a firm who's done a dozen acquisitions. You know, his key takeout was your first acquisition you do is the hardest because you think of, you constantly come up with reasons not to. And at some point, he said, you've just got to take the plunge and do it. Now, clearly, you know, you've got to put all the rights in place to protect yourself so you don't blow yourself up all the business. But he said that, you know, at some point, you've just got to, you've got to take that plunge, commit yourself and move forward. So that's what I'll leave you with. Yes. And it gets easier after that. Absolutely. Guys, thank you so much for your time today. Um, a lot of interesting insight. What would be the best way to get in touch with you if firms are looking for advice or help in buying or selling fees or just general oh, contact us advice. through our website um we can uh we have staff that work with me and mark to, to support us so that we can have the time and the ability to speak to them um yeah and absolutely reach out in any any ways fit you know if, even if it is teletext i believe mark even has that ability so we're available in any streams yeah <laughs> Fantastic. Well, look, I'll, I'll put all your details up on uh, in the show notes, both your profiles and also the link to your website. Um, so once again, thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, Michael. And Thanks, Michael. Have a wonderful yes. day. Good on you. Yes.